Hello, and thank you for joining us on the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. I'm your host, Anthony Corelli. Tonight, we have an amazing episode lined up for you. I really think you're going to enjoy it. You see, tonight we interview a man named Jay. And Jay, he's my kind of guy. He's just a normal, hardworking, blue-collar guy who is honest to a fault. And he was willing to call in and share his struggles with us, as well as how he found freedom through sobriety and deliverance ministry. So if you're somebody who struggles with addiction or alcoholism, I really think you're going to resonate with this guy, and I can't wait for you to meet him. But before we get to that interview, let me take the time to let all the new people know what this podcast is about. This podcast exists to help those who are struggling with spiritual warfare and demonic attack. In my career as a minister and a therapist, I was called to help people with many different types of afflictions, including addiction, mental health issues, as well as spiritual warfare. And praying deliverance with people, I saw many demons who were destroying lives, and I also saw the amazing grace of Jesus Christ save people from those afflictions. And that's what we want to do here. We want to help any of you who reach out to us to either provide you with the help here or to get you the resources and get you to the people that can help you. If you have the time, I humbly ask that you go back and listen to season one of this podcast. Those nine episodes lay the foundation for what we believe here, our theology, if you will. And if you have a little extra time, I encourage you to go back and listen to the first two episodes of this season as well as this episode, because it'll help you understand what we want to do here going forward. So if you feel that you're somebody who is in need or you're struggling, please reach out to us. And here's how you do that. Reach out to us via email at anthony at thestruggleseries.com. That's anthony, common spelling, at thestruggleseries.com. Our team will read through each and every one of those emails and will respond back to you, either by providing you with some resources, praying with you, or if you're somebody who wants your story used on this podcast, we can do that as well. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. We will respond back to everyone, I promise. So without further ado, I'm going to ask that you buckle up and get ready to meet Jay. So I want to welcome Jay to the Freedom from the Struggle podcast. How are you doing today, Jay? Doing wonderful. How about you? Well, you know, I'm doing okay. You know, I just want to give our listeners a, a little bit of a, of a kind of a heads up. Right now in the studio, we have a lot going on um, on this side. And then on Jay's side, um, he's going to have some background noise. He actually has a smoke detector that's beeping, as you can tell. We'll try to work past that as best we can. And there's be some noise on this end. Jay and I have tried to catch up over the last couple of days. And um, the timing of this is going to have to work today and not another day. So therefore we can, um, you know, just kind of blast through this and get to a place where we can, uh, you know, just trudge through the the background noise and get to the subject matter. So um, Jay, I want to, uh, again, thank you for giving us a call. I know when we talked earlier, it seems like you were able to um, listen to uh, the final episode of season one, the ninth episode, and where we walked through a deliverance prayer. And it sounds to me like you were able to maybe receive some deliverance from that episode. Does that sound about accurate? Yes, it's uh, very accurate, actually. Well, that's 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 great to hear. Go ahead. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um... So what happened, you know, I was listening to the to the podcast and uh, you gave a heads up that we were going to do a deliverance prayer. And I thought no better time than now if I have something in me to get it out. So I just felt that urge and that's when I went ahead and uh, I did it. And you, you, I was amazed at what happened. <laughs> I'm kind of taken by it a little bit because it was 
you know, it was truly in an experience in itself. And I've never really had anything like that happen to me. I've seen a numerous amount of things over my lifetime, but that one was truly, it, it, it moved me. So I think it worked. <laughs> well, that's, that's amazing. Praise God for that. Do you mind sharing with the listeners a little bit about maybe what the experience was for you in, in terms of saying the prayer and maybe some of the things you experienced that if somebody would have been there watching what they would have seen? Well, it, it all happened pretty suddenly, you know, uh, uh, being in my background and how I came up and what I've gone through in life. Uh, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Uh, I think I started drinking around the age 13, 14 years old, and I'm 45 years old now, going on 46. And uh, that's quite a while. That's almost a half of a lifetime right there. I was in a bottle. And it's just basically running from problems, running from my life, running from, you know, things that have happened to me in my life and uh, getting into that, you know, it's, it's quite moving, uh, you know, being a Christian and, and going to church and stuff. And, uh, you know, a lot of the times you don't bring out, you don't bring out the secrets. You kind of just, you're there and you're praying and you're talking to God one-on-one -on -one right there. And, you're asking Jesus for help and you have people around you praying for you, praying with you, people walking by and putting their hands on you and praying over you. Uh, it's a moving thing when it happens when the Holy Spirit's working and doing his thing in your life. And, you know, I struggled all my life. Now I'm living sober, uh, two years sober now. And just every day just gets more crystal clear. I'm getting closer to the Lord. I'm just doing what he wants me to do and walk that path and trying to stay on it. I mean, I don't have really any want to drink anymore or again, I don't have anything that like triggers me. I've, I've had bad days. I've had really bad things happen since I've been sober and I haven't looked towards it again. Well, that makes me, makes me feel pretty good being able to say that. Yeah, that's incredible to hear, and that's uh, definitely a testament to the power of the Holy Spirit and just um, your commitment to 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 change. You know, as it says in Second Corinthians five, you know, we're we're a new creation; the old is gone, and the new has passed away. And although that happens spiritually, I think a lot of times it takes us a while to catch up to that in practicality. So it sounds like uh in the in the past sometime in the past and i'm sure you'll get to the details of that you made a decision to put alcohol aside and i believe that's part of that becoming that new creation that god wants you to be now let me ask you a question in terms of alcoholism um and we'll get we'll go backwards a little bit here in a second but in terms of alcoholism have you ever heard it been called a spirit before have you ever heard that terminology where Maybe you have a spirit of alcoholism, or is that something that's new to you? No, I've heard, I've heard the term since I started, you know, alcohol and spirits and, and all of that stuff. And, you know, uh, hearing that, uh, I'm a curious person, so I want to get to the bottom of it and find out, okay, why do they say that? What What's involved with that? And, you know, from the beginning... It's like, okay, well, they just say that, you know, maybe it's just they're, people are conjuring spirits or the spirits are close to people that are, that are drinking and that are intoxicated. I believe it's just you're opening yourself up to that. And sometimes, you know, you could have spirits, I think, of people that have passed away or friends, family. You could have people like that close to you maybe in spirit or on the other hand there's good and evil so you're going to open yourself up to to bad spirits and evil spirits demonic sure. spirits definitely i definitely agree with that now in order to kind of make this story you know fit together especially for listeners who don't know who you are do you mind uh, going back a ways and kind of giving us your background your past maybe 
you know, where you come from, things you've experienced, that type of thing? Yeah. Uh, I come from a, you know, relatively small town, uh, small town mentality. We do have quite a few people nowadays, but everybody still kind of knows everybody around here. Uh, you know, the names of families and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, coming up young and starting uh, drinking at an early age, I think it was, it was a lot of like, you know, uh, lack of supervision. Uh, my parents worked all the time. My dad wasn't ever there. Uh, mom was always working. So, you know, of course we were always at grandparents' house and, you know, they're old. So, I mean, you could take off and they don't know what the heck you're doing. And <laughs> that's pretty much what I did as I was always gone and hanging out with my friends. And, you know, I got into it with a bad bunch of uh, people that, you know, let's drink, let's go smoke cigarettes and, and drink beer and, or whatever we could get our hands on at that time. And, you know, it just became a pattern and, you know, I didn't think much of it because all the men in my family drank ever since I can remember walking or talking. I can remember, you know, dad would have uncles over cousins, friends, whatever family get togethers. There was always alcohol present. It was always there. It was like a learned behavior and maybe passed down through the generations. Men always drank. They were. I come from a blue collar family. So that's what we did. And that was the tradition. So it's just like I picked it up and thought, hey, you know, this is just what the guys do, you know. Absolutely. And I think a lot of times we, you know, blue collar you know, is got a, a, a good connotation and a bad connotation to it. And we're in no way trying to say that blue collar is a bad thing, but it definitely does include that kind of, um, you know, mentality that you work hard, you play hard, you drink. And, and maybe for some people that can be, you know, maybe a, uh, just a common normal thing, but then maybe for people who have things they're hiding or secrets they're keeping or running from i think sometimes that spirit of alcoholism or that spirit of addiction can creep in um and maybe affect one person differently than it would another so i may be assuming here but do you feel that like maybe those were the beginning stages of you using alcohol to maybe cope with other things yes i used alcohol as a coping mechanism for you know a handful of problems that I had uh, in childhood. Uh, I was neglected as a, a small child uh, by a family member. Excuse me, it gets me a little choked up sometimes still, but... Uh, I take your time. Through. Yeah. Uh, and I believe when uh, when a kid's that small, I mean, we don't know. We're innocent. We have no knowledge of anything, really, but not until, like, you know, it, it's just something inside of me said, this isn't right. You should not let this happen. You should not, you know, I, there was just like a, a voice inside my head in the back of my head telling me that this isn't right and you need to get away from this person. And, you know, this person got so far, I mean, it, I don't think that it was in depth, uh, really, you know, it, as bad as it could have been if, if I would have partook in this thing and, and let it transpire until the finish. But, uh, you know, I got away from that person and I got far away from that person until the point to where parents came back. They left me with, with, uh, with a, with a family member. Uh, it was for a few hours and they, you know, they drove away to go do something. I don't know what they did. You kids play and you guys, you know, the person in position of trust was supposed to be responsible and trustworthy. And they didn't turn out being that way. And, you know, just from then to now, and I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe that family member was maybe abused as a small child themselves. And it's just a pattern in it, and it comes back. And I believe it's something that's rooted in evil. I believe that's what the devil does, is he uses those evil doings and those evil ways to, to keep on trying to do this over periods of time through people and uh you know that was one instance uh of abuse that happened to me 
And then I was abused also physically by another uh, family member in position of trust and a, a, a supposed authority figure in my life and in other people's lives. And uh, it just didn't ever sit well with me. And, and sitting there as a young kid thinking about stuff like this, you know, I didn't want to think about it. I just wanted to get as far away from it, forget about it. It never, like it never happened. But, you know, finding out over time and you keep jumping in a bottle that those problems never go away. They just, you can bury them and bury them, but sooner or later they'll rear their ugly heads again. And then what can you do? But, you know, you got to go through things and you got to go through tribes and tribulations in life. And it's not until you decide to face those things that, you know, you, you realize that you're not alone and that Jesus is with you. God is with you. He absolutely is. And I, I want to kind of pause here and just thank you for your transparency and your boldness in um, telling that part of your story. I think a lot of times, you know, like you said, I think at the beginning of this conversation where we go to churches, but we all have these secrets. So um, I think they say in the sobriety realm that secrets keep you sick. And I think you disclosing this not only helps us hear your story, but hopefully what it does is it helps those listening see that being transparent about those deep, dark secrets of our lives actually takes power away from the enemy because it's those secrets that he uses, the shame and the guilt, which in your case, in these scenarios, wasn't even your shame and guilt to have, but somehow it gets transferred onto you. So I just applaud you for that boldness in, in disclaiming that, in, in claiming that, in disclosing that. I want to I want to kind of ask you that um as these things are happening and you're a child um trying to make sense of it did you ever notice like the emotions or were were you too young to even know how to put words to those emotions Yeah being that young there was definitely not a word that I can find for it it was just it was just emotion of sadness and terror. I was, I was afraid. Sure. And you know, it's, it's not an easy thing when something that evil happens. It's, no, I, it's, a, it's an extremely yeah. difficult thing to, to fathom, you know, and then getting older and you have, uh, you have a family and you have children that that's the last thing you like you it's always on the back of your mind you don't ever want to leave them with somebody you're nervous to have them around people i mean like things used to happen to me by a person the one of the people that abused me Th this person would would abuse you when everyone else was in the other room they would find they, they would find their way to you and it would be like you have to run in the other room screaming and crying but it's like you know I come from a big family. There was always a lot of kids. So, I mean, you know, the adults really never paid much mind to it. Oh, they'll get over it. You know, they'll shut up after a while, whatever, brush it under the rug, you know. And uh, there was a point in time where I actually, I, I try to come out and say some things and, and, and say something about it. And it kind of didn't go well. Like, uh, I, I, they didn't believe me. Let's put it that way. Ouch. And, so then it was like, okay, well, whatever. It must have not been that big of a deal. So I just put it at the back of my mind again. But there it is right there when, you know, I'm over here partaking in, you know, social festivities, drinking and, and stuff like that. But then, you know, it's okay in the beginning. But then after time goes on and the same patterns and the same, patterns, you know, the drinking's going to get more excessive. Uh, you know, the brand of alcohol that you're drinking is more potent than it was in the beginning. You know, you're looking just for a way to numb yourself and forget about it. It's when it comes out again, when you're extremely intoxicated to when I've actually gone into like a rage. Nobody sure. can control me. 
somebody else is at the wheel. <laughs> you know, people call it blackouts, call it what you will, but your mind and your body come apart at a certain point, but you got to think about, hey, what's taking over me? You'll hear the next day or many people in this in this struggle they don't remember what happened. I mean, horrific things can happen. I mean, I've seen people uh, uh, and I've heard stories of people and people that I know, uh, a, a former coworker of mine got so drunk and hammered after work one day, he decided to drive home. Well, he wrecked into some little old lady, killed her, didn't know he got in a wreck, drove home got home, passed out, woke up in, in jail. He didn't even know what happened. Somebody had to go and tell him that he killed somebody, took someone's life. Wow. And that's just, I've been to that point to where I've been in a blackout, waking up in, in county jail in a holding cell full of blood. And it's like, wow, wow what, what did I do? And then it's not until you get out and they're booking you in, they tell you, oh yeah, you're, you're in here, you got your disorderly conduct. You know, I didn't even know I, I beat somebody up so bad that they bled all over me and they thought it was me that was bleeding and it, it was the person that I, I had gone into a rage over. And it was like, okay, I'm not like that. I'm not that type of person. When I'm sober, I'm the nicest, <laughs> happiest, go lucky, easy going person. But it's, that person that that comes that takes over when you're so intoxicated, I believe that I had demonic spirits in me, and these things were these things were driving me. And you know, listening to the podcast and listening to different episodes, it's like I've seen behaviors in myself, and listening to the, some of the story and some of the subject matter, that it's like, wow, I I was overcome by something. And then it wasn't until I did that deliverance, I was like, it looked like smoke was coming out of my mouth, like diesel smoke. That's what I, I, that's all I can describe what came out of me. And I, I don't know if I was just in tune or, or in such deep prayer, but I, it, it just felt like the evil was coming out of me that has been buried and lying dormant for so many years that. <laughs> I'm completely taken by it. It just, it muddles me. It, it's crazy. You know, um, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of go into teaching mode here a little bit for the listeners. So I want to, I want to take what Jay said and, and break it down because I don't know if you're listening. This, this man is pretty wise um, to the ways of the spirit. And, and I think, it it speaks of the authenticity of his story because as he's speaking, you can kind of understand everything that he's saying. He's a young child. These horrible abuses have been perpetrated on him. And it shows you how the enemy, and I think he said this earlier in this conversation, that the enemy is kind of wiggling his way in by using other people's behavior, just our circumstances, to where there was no avenue for him to pursue relief from the abuse, even voicing it to the people who were supposed to take care of him. You know, the devil had, had created a scenario where he wasn't believed because of just by reasons of there's a lot of kids around kids cry. So it was quickly brushed over where I'm sure now, the adults would have wished they would have paid more attention. But, but as we move past that, as Jay's talking, he's saying that you get to a point where you have to start coping with all of these kind of deep rooted issues, the emotions, the thoughts that a young person doesn't know how to put together in their mind. And so alcohol seems to be kind of a, a, an easy uh, coping mechanism for a young person person because it's numbing and it also kind of maybe helps to push aside I, I would say the voices whether those are his own voice or actual demonic voices it pushes them down but eventually you drink too much and then 
it like almost has a reverse effect and that comes out in these rageful moments. And again, as you hear Jay tell these stories in, in a, such a transparent and honest manner of waking up in a jail cell, you know, you can see the demonic scheme has already, I mean, infiltrated his life so much that he's, he's like in a cycle, like almost lost in a, in a perpetual state of hopelessness, perpetual state of, I'm going to drink because I need to numb this. And then when I drink too much, I cause more problems. And so Jay, I'm going to, I'm going to kind of take us back a little bit. So in these younger days, did you experience any paranormal activity? Were you starting to see evidence of demons beyond just the internal stuff? Uh, I believe that I would have like things happen to me when I was sleeping. I would feel like I, I, I can describe the feeling of fear and seeing these demons when I was dreaming. I don't know if it, you know, if I I used to get told all the time that I had the most vivid imagination that any kid could ever possibly have. But I've been through therapy. I've talked to numerous different psychologists and psychiatrists. Uh, the only thing they could make a, an assumption or come to any type of conclusion was that I have a photographic memory. So <clears throat> that being said, like I've never really... I can remember things that have that have happened to me in my life that, you know, being so young, they say, oh, you, how do you how do you remember those type of things? How could you remember that? Or I'll say something to one of my parents or to one of my siblings. Hey, do you remember when this happened? Or and they're like, just I did. I forgot. I, I had no idea. I, I didn't even remember that happened. How do you remember? I said, I can remember it's like yesterday. So I'm having, as a kid, jumping back, I'm having dreams and I'm seeing demons and they're trying, they're trying to get inside of me. And since a very early age, you know, uh, I was born and baptized and raised as a Catholic, but, you know, we only really went to church when somebody got married or somebody passed away. And I can remember going to catechism to make my first communion and do all those things I never got to finish because, you know, my parents, uh, they, they split up and divorced when I was a a very young teen around the age of 12 or 13. That's about when I started drinking is after when all that stuff happened to me. So being a very young person, I had grand grandparents that grandmothers that were devoutly Catholic. I mean, praying all the time. And, you know, I was always uh, aware and knew about Jesus and about God and about who I should serve in life. And I always had a belief and I always believed in it. But there was always something when you're a kid, it's like, oh, this is just nonsense. And why do I have to go? And I don't want to do this. And, you know, I've always been aware of that there's always been good and also there's evil. But having these dreams, it would be all I could come to the conclusion of in these dreams to make them subside or not be as severe and, and scare me as bad was uh, being able to to pray. And only through prayer was were, were these things able to stop and leave me alone. But over time and as I got older, these things, they got stronger and they would come at me harder. And only through prayers, like I've, I've been able to, to hold these things at bay. And it wasn't actually until I think maybe after probably about the first year of being sober, I started like not really having so much of those types of dreams. Like it's now it's dreams are better. Let's put it that way. I'm a very vivid dreamer, I guess, but. I believe that's that's also maybe a gateway to the other side too and to where you can be able to see uh I might also have an ability when I'm asleep that I can stop and think and I can sort of tr- change the tide and turn the tide around into something that's not so bad now that I'm sober 
but being a drinker for so many years that it, it, I, I can't explain or put into words and actually articulate what these things look like. They're the most horrific things. And all I could think of is this is what it's going to look like peering into hell. I can't say that I'm going to go there. I, I believe in Jesus. He's in my heart. I believe that he's saved me. I believe that through repent and being able to and get all these things and the deliverance that I had, it, it gives me more ammunition and it, it, it helps me to walk closer with the Lord and he helps me. I mean, this is an everyday thing. Like these thoughts come through my mind all the time and it's, it's getting easier. It's not getting harder. It's getting easier. Absolutely. Let me ask you just, if you don't mind sharing, how many days of sobriety do you have? I am at 668 days. Wow. That is absolutely incredible. And I have not. So when I, when I think of that many days of sobriety and it's easy to say, well, it's gotten easier for you. And I think you said earlier too, that it's, it's kind of one of those deals to where, you know, harder at first, easier now. Um, but these struggles continued. Would you say that, you know, as you found that sobriety and your dreams started to get better and in my belief system, you know, we open portals or doors. I think portals is the parapsychology term, but I like to say we open doors for the demons to kind of infiltrate our lives. Would you say that the alcohol being a part of your past now closed some of those doors? I believe so. I definitely believe so because, I mean, you're, when you're drunk and to the point to where, like, what the way I used to get, I would just, it would be, uh, I used to call it the case study because I would drink like a case of beer and it would, it, <laughs> and I could still conduct myself like I was totally sober. I can fool a lot of people. And, you know, those types of behaviors and those types of actions, I believe are the devil. That's the that nail on the head is his behavior. He's the one that's in control of you when you let yourself get to that certain spot, you know, and only, only being able to get away from that and turn your back on that. And then the way that I feel now having, I have a, a, a soon to be four year old little girl. Like I knew I had to wise up and I knew I had to be closer to God because how could I turn the evil that was in me and how can I get, I, I don't want her to have any kind of experience or any attachment that I might have on me pass on to her. And then her, I have a hard time growing up or, you know, these things affect her like they've affected me. And I mean, I just, I believe being on the right side and being on, being in the light and being with Jesus is the only way to be because, you know, we're safe. There's no worry. There's no anxiety. Uh, there's no, there's nothing, everything you could be honest, you could feel comfortable in your own skin, you know, which the devil, he just would trick you and say, Oh yeah, go jump into that bottle and forget about all that stuff that happened to you and have a good time and relax. But then later on, you're so jacked up that they're, it's causing you to cause violence and bring those things up and amplify them times 10. You know, so that's basically in a nutshell how I feel about it. Yeah. And I, I 100% agree with you. I think, and as you've heard my podcast, you and I spoke before the recording, you know, you, you can look at, at these demons as these very crafty beings that are literally set to destroy you. You know, we learn, we learn in scripture that these sons of God, these B'nai Elohim, had relations with human women and had these beings called Nephilim. And these beings were not given the chance at redemption like humans. 
And you think of God saying to us that coming to him gives us permission to be called the sons of God. So if these were the sons of God and their offspring, and now God is saying those people are corrupted and can no longer be redeemed, but I will give these people who I died for permission to be called the sons of God. These beings hate us and they, their sole intent is to destroy us 100% wholeheartedly. I've said often that if a demon could, they would kill you in a second, but God's hand is always covering us, you know, and, and, and what he allows is simply to draw our attention back to him. And so as these beings, from what your story is, has outlined as these beings kind of manipulated you and methodically deconstructed you from childhood by putting people in your life and, and maybe some of them were evil, or maybe some of them were just participating in evil. But what it sounds like is that that evil was perpetrated on you. You know, Jay, a lot of people, when they hear me say about family curses or people putting a curse on you, I think oftentimes I, maybe it's my fault that I haven't gone into enough depth, but sometimes those curses aren't verbal curses put on you. Sometimes there's things like abuse that actually curses you because evil and sin is put upon an innocent person. That's a scheme of the devil. That's a scheme to take this beautiful, innocent creature and corrupt them to where they doubt God and they doubt God's love for them. Because as anybody would ask, why did this happen to me? And so I think as I heard your story, and I'm sure somewhere in your life, you said those words, but maybe because there's no answers, you just turn to these coping mechanisms, but these beings that hated you were methodically deconstructing you to the point to where the alcoholism was, you know, very severe. And yet somehow God found you in the midst of all that and gave you the strength to put that aside 668 days ago. Was there a specific instance or was it just a cumulative type of thing that happened when you made that decision? 668 days ago well basically uh it was uh it was me you know i was i was doing my patterns and i'd like to say you know i'm i'm a perfectly functioning alcoholic i can go drink one night and then be at work the next day no problem and get the work day over with and then go do the same thing i did it for so many years you know it just became a, a way of life and that's how i did it but, uh, you know, being that person, uh, 668 days ago, it happened to me. And it also happened to, uh, my fiance who, uh, stopped drinking the day after I did. And we made a decision that we weren't, we weren't going to live that way anymore. And our daughter was too precious. Her innocence is too precious. Uh, her and I have a lot of in common. Uh, her at a very young age had, you know, her parents weren't around very much. And, you know, she had a, uh, one of her parents was always in the bar. So, you know, uh, her and, and her, her brother, uh, were always, you know, there with, with their parent at the bar. And I said, you know what, I was kind of the same way growing up, you know, and you don't want to look at it in a bad way. But you want to say, because you love your loved one that was with you at the time. We made the decision together that it had to be both of us. It couldn't just be one of us. And by doing that, you know, we took all the power away from the devil there. And we took a stand and I said, God has to be 100% the reason our daughter has to be 100% the reason and he'll see us through this. And every single day it's a choice and it's an easy choice for me. It's my love for my daughter 
and to succeed as a good parent to not do it and to not partake and the lord's just given me so much strength and so much so much more depth in him to lean on that i i don't feel any need or want for that anymore i'm actually turned off to the whole thing uh my fiance works in the bar industry she's a bar manager and she's sober i've gone there to her work and you know i'll help her get things stocked up and make sure she's got everything she needs for work if i can help her out at all and i sit there for a minute and i see some of the people that i used to uh partake in and festivities with and uh, to be honest, it's the most obnoxious thing I've ever encountered. <laughs> and then I can, all I can think is, was I that obnoxious? Was I that annoying that like, I just couldn't stand it. I can only stay there for 30 minutes at the, at the tops because people just get on my nerves that bad. And it just seems to me like the evil that's in these people are trying to come out at me and they're trying to lash out at me. It's so weird. I can go places. I can go like Walmart, for instance, I need to go to customer service cause I need to pay a bill or I need to put some money on a prepaid card to pay a bill. And it's like, he tests me every time I go, every time I go there, I see something that's trying to stick its ugly evil head out and get to me. And I know if I let that get to me, then I'm weak and it's already defeated me. So I just have to relax. I say the name of Jesus to myself over and over again. Help me with this. Walk with me. People freak out on me at work because I'm having a conversation and they think I'm talking to myself, but I'm talking to God the whole time. And through that and through these behaviors that I've, I can't say that anybody else does them. I haven't seen anybody else do this. But I believe, and I believe in having that type of relationship and, and being that close with them and talking with them that much during the day, it brings me that much closer and it gives me that much more strength to do battle with these demons and to do battle with evil, you know, because I'm a superhero fanatic to the bone and I'm always been for the good guy. I know a lot of people <laughs> that like villains and villains are cool and they cuss and they say cool, funny stuff. But that's not who you want to be because the devil is the villain. God is the good is the good guy. And we always want to be on the good team. We want to be on the good guy's side. Absolutely. And, you know, if you think about in the very beginning in the garden, this devil, this, you know, villain of all villains, to use your word, comes across and and tells a a, a lie a, a tainted version of the truth and convinces these the first two people to eat this forbidden fruit and see as god sees you know knowing good and evil well it was really about the knowing the evil because they already knew the good because god walked with them and i think a lot of times we don't put two and two together to say that we've all had our forbidden fruit. Maybe for you, it was alcohol. Maybe for another listener, it's another addiction of some sort or another behavior of some sort, but it's the same lie that's been told. And I, and I love what you said that, you know, it's Jesus and, and your hope and belief in him that carries you through every day. And you know, as, as we kind of wrap up this interview, um, and you know, you've, you've heard this in previous episodes, but I, I always make sure I tell people this as we, as we kind of move forward in this deliverance process, you know, in Matthew twelve forty three, um, same, same passages in Mark, but it says when the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest, but finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house, which is you, which is your body from which I came. And when it comes, it finds the house empty, underline the word empty, swept and put in order. 
Then it goes and it brings it with it seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and dwell there, and the last state of a person is worse than the first. So also will it be with this evil generation. And I want to kind of give you some encouragement here because what I believe is that there were probably attempts in your life to stop drinking. And what you did, according to this passage, is, is you swept the place, put it in order, but it was empty. And those spirits that are attached to you went away for a little while. But then when they came back and saw that that house was empty, they brought more than just itself, more evil than itself, and just continued the sabotage at a much higher level, which is why things like alcoholism progress to these horrible places, because it's a constant spiritual battle. But now, Jay, you've renounced these things. You've said a deliverance prayer, and I, and I love uh, the way you told the story, because so many people consider deliverance to be something kooky or fantastical, but it's not. You actually saw the smoke leave your body. And somebody like me who's done this for a while has seen these types of things. And it's supernatural, but but for you, it's an indication that you're free, that you've been um delivered. And as you've said today, and I'm and I'm sure you get this, but I'm gonna say it for you as well as the listeners. Don't let that house be empty. You fill that with the Holy Spirit. You fill it with um, the the love of Jesus. You pursue Jesus. You you immerse yourself in this life that Jesus has given you, this new life, this new creation. And when those spirits come back, there's no place for them to dwell, which is like you said, it's getting easier for you all the time. And so now that you've received this deliverance, I think you are well on your way to being the man that you always wanted to be, you know, and as I hear you, I love that you're a real guy. You're a man's man. I wish some of you listening to this can see Jay's a big stocky kind of construction (laughs) worker type guy with a beard and a bald head and not the kind of guy you'd want to tangle with in an alley, but you can hear his heart and his conviction. And so that same mentality that would be used to fight the the wrong fight in your early life, you just turn that around and use that same fight to hold on to your, your relationship with Jesus, not just your sobriety. That's just a part of that new spiritual direction that you're going. And God not only will reward that, but I actually believe, and I'll prophesy this over you now that you're destined for bigger things that you're destined to live a life where God uses you in the way that the devil was trying to squash, because let's be honest, listeners, for him to go through these things that he went through, there's got to be some bigger purpose for his life. And I'll say this a thousand times before this podcast goes off the air one day, how beautiful is a soul that both the God of, of the universe and the devil are both fighting for it. And in Jay's case, The devil was fighting for his soul because I believe he's meant for great things. And so, Jay, my encouragement to you is that as you keep in your scriptures, that you keep in prayer, that you keep your ears open to that direction that God wants you to go, because this story isn't over. It isn't over with a deliverance ministry prayer. I believe it's just the beginning of you finding your purpose. Would you agree? I agree 100%. I want to, like, be able to get my story out there. I want, like, like you said, I, you know, I am a man's man. I, I'm a blue collar dude. I been doing construction for like 20 something years. And, you know, I, I, I wouldn't discourage anybody from, if you have those things buried deep down in you, you need to get them out and, and deal with them sooner than later, because later it always gets worse if you don't. And I believe that, you know, being honest and being in the light is the only way to be. Uh, Before, it's like, okay, you got to be full of so much macho ego that 
you know, you, 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 you feel actually weak if you're, if you're vulnerable, but I think that's all wrong. I say, be vulnerable, be scared, do things, do things that, that make you uncomfortable in that way and get comfortable with it. Because I mean, if you're more aware and you're more in the light and you're walking with Jesus, man, your life can just be so much more full of things than you ever imagined. I mean, I take advantage these days of the littlest, stupidest things that people are like, man, you're just having a good old time with that. And it's just like little things that you, that you just pass up every day. I get the biggest joy out of those little things that I just never, I never paid attention to when I was in a bottle. I just didn't care for it. It just, all the only thing that mattered to me was not having to feel those feelings and not feeling the pain. But I think that's probably one of the best things about life is you have to feel it. If you don't feel it, then I, I think you're just as good as dead and you don't feel nothing, you know, and you're just lost. I agree. And as we wrap up, Jay, I just want to say a little prayer for you. I'm sure this won't be goodbye for the last time because Jay and I have kind of vowed to stay in touch, but I just want to pray and prophesy over you a little bit. So do you mind if I do that? No, go ahead. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for this man who is committed to living his life for you, God. We just uh, thank you so much for being true to your word that you love us with a love that cannot be explained, a love that would send your son to die for us. And that same love permeates time and space where in the right moment, according to your timing, you found Jay, you first instilled a, a, a desire to end the alcoholism and close that door with sobriety and then ultimately lead him to pray a prayer of deliverance. He believed in you, but he couldn't quite figure out why things weren't clicking. And now that he's received that deliverance, God, I just pray that you would just continue to guide him in his life. God, I, I believe in my spirit that you've told me that he is destined for great things, that he is going to far exceed any expectations that he or anybody else had for his life, that his story is valuable and that his testimony is is one for that blue collar type of guy that you can be a tough motorcycle riding bald headed bearded guy and still find vulnerability and and transparency with your emotions and the things that you struggled with and that if you give those to God that he'll allow you to keep your manhood but not not make you somebody who's hardened or or broken but that you're actually a whole son of the almighty God who can take care of his family and take care of business and take care of people that come his way because he's been softened by the Holy Spirit in a way that will help others. So God, I just pray that his story would permeate these airwaves, that it would permeate his circle of friends, and that you would use him in a mighty, mighty way to help others. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Jay, I want to thank you for your time. Uh, and thanks for joining us on the podcast. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Okay, buddy? Thank you very much. God bless. Yeah, blessings. I can't begin to tell you how much I enjoyed that interview with Jay. It's so refreshing to have somebody who's that transparent with their lives. And I hope that by hearing Jay's story, you understand that we're all in this together. That this human condition of ours that includes the flesh and sin, as well as demonic forces that are trying to tear us into pieces. We can't do this alone, and we shouldn't do this alone. And not only can we find help through the love and grace of Jesus Christ, but we could find help through people who exhibit that love and grace and who are willing to do life with us, get in the mud with us. And that's what Jay reminds me of. He reminds me of somebody who at times of his life was broken, but he was always worth it. 
He was always valuable. And God was always reaching down and try to lift him up. And I'm so glad that Jay found the freedom that he was looking for. And I believe that his future is going to be brighter than he ever imagined. For those of you who resonate with Jay, I'd like to pray with you a little bit. And I want to ask you to just humble your heart. Maybe your story isn't exactly like Jay's. Maybe you're not even somebody who's an addict or an alcoholic, but you understood his struggles, his past, his wounds, and something's tugging on your heart. I believe that's the Holy Spirit reaching out to show you that there is freedom from your particular struggle. So pray with me. Father God, what an amazing invention called a podcast where strangers could meet, not even face to face, but just meet in a common place with common struggles. And God, I pray that you would use that medium right now for us to reach anybody who is listening with their struggles. God, I pray that you would reach down and begin to break the bonds of any evil forces that are attacking their lives. God, I pray that you would break the chains that have bound them for who knows how long. And demons, you are loosed. You no longer have control because these people are willing to turn their lives over to Jesus Christ. So demons, flee in the name of Jesus. I pray the blood of Jesus over their lives right now in this moment. You are commanded to leave. Get out in the name of Jesus. Leave in the name of Jesus. You are no longer welcome here in the name of Jesus. We renounce our sin. We renounce our permissions that we've given to allow you into our lives. We renounce those in the name of Jesus. And Jesus, we commit our lives to you. We love you and we believe in you. And we ask you to be Lord of our lives. Fill those empty spaces in our lives with your Holy Spirit, with your love and your grace. Make it to where there's no room for demons. There's no room because we're so full of your Holy Spirit, God. We're sorry for what we've done. We repent of those things and we ask that you set us free and that you do life with us like the Savior that you've always been willing to come down to earth and experience what we experience so you can love us even more and set us free. Jesus, we thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the gift of deliverance. And we especially thank you for the gift of grace that saves us, even in our worst. No matter what we've done, you forgive us. And that's what love truly is. So thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your mighty name. Amen. Again, I want to thank you so much for joining us on this episode. If you prayed that prayer with us, or if you feel you need help, again, reach out to us at anthony at thestruggleseries.com. That's how you begin contact with us, and we'll reach out to you from there. Remember, this podcast is new, but we want to grow it because we want to build an army of prayer warriors and a safe place for people who need that prayer. So if you can help us, I would greatly appreciate it. Smash those like buttons, click those thumbs up, leave us good reviews. As I heard another podcaster say the other day, if you want to leave us a negative review, just hit the thumbs down twice. It'll help us. Some of you will know what that means. Some of you won't. But please help us grow this podcast. Share it with a friend. Share this episode with a friend if you feel they're struggling like Jay was struggling. If you want to reach out to us via social media, um, you can find our social media in the show notes, but let me take some time to break it down. You can find us on Facebook at freedomfromthestruggle.com or at thestruggleseries.com. That's my page for all my books, but you can find us there. Everything is linked together on Facebook. Instagram, it's anthony.corelli. You will find us there on YouTube. We also broadcast this audio on YouTube at Freedom From The Struggle. 
You can find us on Twitter at FFTS Podcast. And if you are interested, we do offer some bonus content through our Patreon campaign. There are two levels of Patreon. The first level is a $2 level where you simply just helping us to keep this podcast on the air. We will give you a shout out for your participation in that Patreon campaign. And at the $5 level, that will provide you with access to the two bonus episodes that we do every month on this podcast. And in those bonus episodes, we break down uh, some popular or sometimes lesser known possession cases and how deliverance ministry may have been a better intervention than what uh, these people initially did when they sought out help. And there is actually a bonus episode that we offered for free uh, where you're listening to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You could find that free bonus episode that was actually just released uh, last weekend. And so you can get a little taste of what we do there as well. Again, thank you so much for joining us. I can't wait to see you next week. And may God bless you and keep you and bring peace to your life. Have a great, great evening. Thank you.